So, Tom, you're a, a micro paleontologist. That's then. right, yes. Um, for someone that has no knowledge of that area, can you tell me a bit about what that field's about? Then? Yeah, so um, I study basically the remains of very, very small um, organisms. Um, and, and the particular group that I study are single celled um, algae that live across the whole of the surface of, of the modern day oceans. Um, but these algae, these tiny, tiny single cells, produce um, a, a sort of hard skeleton of plates made out of calcium carbonate. Yeah. Calcium carbonate's what we call like limestone in, yeah. in modern, in kind of standard language, or you know what you find in the bottom of your, your kettle when you boil your right, cup yeah. of tea. That's that's calcium carbonate yeah. that's coming out of the water. So these things form um, lots of tiny plates around their cell, made out of calcium carbonate. Um, and when they die, um, these plates fall off and sink down to the bottom of the ocean. Um, so when you go out into the, the, the deep ocean, um, most of the sediments that accumulate in, in the ocean um, are made up of the remains of these, these tiny organisms. Um, and by looking at how um, the chemistry of their shells um, and the different species change through time, um, you can try and understand how the oceans have changed over time and how that's related to climate. Um, so I'm really trying to understand the links between biology, so marine ecosystems, yeah. uh, long-term climate change over hundreds of thousands of years, up to tens of millions of years, um, and, and, and uh, the sort of global carbon cycle and how they all relate together. Yeah, so how did you get into that area in the first place then? Um, a slightly circuitous um, route. Um, I originally sort of, I guess I fell in love with paleontology, so study of ancient, ancient life and fossils. Yeah. Um, while I was at university, I did a project actually looking at much, much uh, deeper time uh, interval, actually when uh, animals uh, first appear in the fossil record, when you first get yeah. kind of large organisms called the, the Cambrian explosion. It happened about 540 million years ago, so really early in the history of life. I'm looking at the sort of origin of, of um, some of the first skeletons that you see in rocks. Um, and was kind of you know, quite infused by, by that uh, and by the idea, um, but wasn't really sure I wanted to go on that really kind of fundamental, mm. pure paleontology route. Um, and actually ended up you know, uh, doing a, a further course um, in, in hydrogeology. So this is looking at how water moves through rocks. Um, and worked actually as a, a, a hydrogeologist for several years, um, mainly looking at how contamination um, flows through through uh, you know, rock systems and aquifers, um, and mainly working actually sort of around the West Midlands in um, old gas works, trying to clean them up and trying to present, prevent contamination flowing off site. Yeah. And then after a few years of doing that, it was kind of a choice of either going into kind of sort of more management kind of side of things, mm. um, or going back to, to, to more pure sort of research. Um, I decided, yeah, it was now or never. Um, and then it was kind of one of those serendipitous kind of moments. I met my particular PhD supervisor for the first time. I remember um, walking to meet him that, that first time thinking, you know, why am I doing this project? Why am I kind of interested yeah. in this stuff? Why am I meeting this guy? Um, and then just met him and straight away that, you know, that was it. It was a great kind of working relationship and we still work really closely yeah. together. The right many decision years on. then? Yeah, totally. So I think, you know, it's, it's funny how, you know, particular characters can, you know, in a way, sets your kind of research path but it why I sort of really like what I'm doing now is it links that sort of fundamental kind of understanding life from a sort of paleontological point of view with more of a, a kind of applied sense of yeah. trying to understand how how climate works on yeah. long long time scales and I feel that that sort of draws the, the my sort of two interests together it feels more kind of applied and more relevant to yeah. kind of the big questions that we're facing. Yeah, so I was going to ask you about that. What what can learning about um, climates and oceans from 20, 30 million years ago tell us about the world now? Yeah, uh, that's a really good good point. And one of the key things we're trying to understand, you know, um, we're trying to, or many climate scientists are trying to predict, mm. you know, what the world is going to be like with maybe six, seven hundred parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere mm. when you're looking sort of the next hundred, hundred fifty years ahead. Um, but humans have only really experienced um, CO2 levels around about sort of 280 to the current levels of, of 380 parts per million. Okay. Um, so we only have instrumental data yeah. um, within a very narrow range. We're trying to predict almost double that range. Mm. Now if you go back in Earth history, 
the last time we saw CO2 levels that high was actually about 35 million years ago. Um, when you rewind the clock that far, that's yeah. when um, the Antarctic ice sheet was first beginning to form. Um, and actually formed quite rapidly, um, geologically rapidly. We think there's a big sort of threshold. As you reduce CO2, uh, you get the cooling, and then at, at some point the ice sheet becomes stable and very rapidly forms. Mm. So I'm, one of my main interests is trying to understand that transition from very warm climate states mm. with high CO2 levels um, and, and no ice on either pole, um, and that sudden sort of transition into, into our sort of modern kind of... Uh, glaciated state where we have a, you know, a permanent and large ice sheet in Antarctica. And what's interesting about that is that it seems to correlate with some major changes in, in marine ecosystems. Um, so there seems to be a, a lot more sort of biological productivity um, with the onset of that glaciation as you know, the winds and the ocean circulation seem to speed up as you get bigger gradients in temperature from the equatorial regions to the high latitudes. Um, so there's some really interesting sort of transitions yeah. uh, that happen through that, through that event really quite fundamental things that might happen with our, um, I guess, our food sources and uh, environment around us. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and some of the other questions, I guess the other sort of big question that people are trying to answer is what is the effect of um, CO2 on the chemistry of the oceans? So when you put CO2 into, into the surface ocean, you actually make it more acidic. Um, and obviously, you know, the, my... my <laughs> The little organisms I study, the little algae, yeah. uh, producing a calcium carbonate um, a skeleton, a bit like you know corals are also producing calcium carbonate mm. skeletons. And many marine organisms are, are doing the same thing, producing a hard skeleton of calcium carbonate. Now, as you know, when you descale your kettle, you know you might pour vinegar in or mm. some other sort of stronger acid, acetic yeah. acid, and that dissolves away the carbonate. Yeah. Effectively, we're doing something a bit similar. On, on a global scale, by putting CO2 in the atmosphere, you're making the surface ocean a bit more acidic, um, which is potentially limiting the ability of some of these organisms to produce um, their, their hard, hard skeleton. Okay. Um, and this is a real kind of concern at the moment, how much of an effect that's going to have, um, particularly on things like coral reefs that are also being hit by kind of warming and um, increased nutrients in the oceans, but also these, these tiny algae which form the basis of much of the sort of open ocean uh, food chain. So one of the things we're trying to look at is, is are there similar events many, many millions of years ago um, where you have a rapid input of CO2 into the atmosphere, um, potentially ocean acidification in the surface ocean, and trying to look at what the effect um, on these tiny algae was in those ancient, ancient times. OK, and that doesn't sound like something you can really find out from your desk at, at work. Do you, do you get out? Do you do much field work? Yeah, that, that's one of the, the, I think the best bits of... Uh, the research that I do is yeah. actually um, going to places and collecting the sort of fundamental records um, that we use. Um, so for the last sort of two, three years, I've actually been working on a, um, a series of deep ocean cores um, from the um, equatorial Pacific. So this is the very high biological, uh, biologically productive area. Um, if you imagine um, your North America and South America, um, and you have the Panama um, Isthmus, the narrow bit through Panama, if you go due, um, due west of there, so you're going out into the Pacific, yeah. there's a very high product, biological productivity uh, region where basically the currents diverge apart from each other and bring up nutrient-rich waters from below. Um, <clears throat> so I was involved in a, a two-month uh, research cruise um, out from Honolulu on Hawaii, out to this area. It was nice. tough. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Um, but we spent two months on board a ship basically drilling um, sediment cores, so we would drill up to sort of four or five hundred meters mm. down into the deep ocean sediments and recover a whole series of, of cores of this, um, the biological remains, the fossil, uh, the microfossils that produce yeah. the ocean sediments in that region to try and reconstruct how that productivity, how that upwelling system has changed over the last 50 million years. Um, and that's really the sort of fundamental source of a lot of our information is, is these deep ocean uh, sediment cores. And did you get the results that you were hoping for? Yes, we did. We, we, one of the main targets was really to try and reconstruct um, the history of Pacific uh, life, um, climate and ocean chemistry uh, in a continuous record over the last 50 million years. Um, and we've just had a, a paper out in Nature earlier this year, which had... Um, it was Congratulations. Nice, yes, thanks. <laughs> um, not, I wasn't the lead author. Um, but basically looking at how the deep ocean 
chemistry of the Pacific has changed over that time. So we're getting really excellent high resolution um, records um, of that interval. Brilliant. So it's, yeah, it's going well. Sounds, got, sounds exciting as well. Yeah. And uh, just thinking about Birmingham, what, what, does, uh, what does having a Birmingham Fellowship allow you to do in your, in your research? I think the best thing about um, having the fellowship mm. is being able to develop your own independent research identity. Mm. I think that's one of the hardest things um, as a relatively young uh, researcher is actually establishing your own kind of niche, your own yep. identity. You, know, you do various postdoc um, research positions where you're working for someone else doing their research mm. project and actually to, to establish your own expertise um, and your own sort of research field is a really critical thing. So having that five years of largely protected research yeah. time uh, gives you the chance to do that and also the sense that you don't have to um, worry about the next step necessarily so you, you're really sort of um, has a sense of developing your, your expertise and then hopefully at the end of the fellowship um, using in that and contributing to the wider kind of teaching and um, being a, a fully involved member of staff here. And how's that? How's the research going in Birmingham so far? Then yes, well, yeah. well, it um, feels like a, um, a very good collaborative kind of department. I feel I've had more kind of research conversations in the last few months than I have had in uh, several years at previous institutions. Yeah. So it feels yeah. like everyone's very, very keen to, to understand and um, to collaborate uh, with the research. So it feels like yeah. a really good research environment. Okay, great. And ha you're living in Birmingham now? Or? Uh, yes, I live just outside of Birmingham, yep. um, in a, a town called Bromsgrove, so in the north Worcestershire sort of countryside, yep. quite near the M5, but um, really enjoying... Uh, Sounds quite picturesque. <laughs> it's lovely, it's really nice. It's lovely to be able to see the Malvern Hills from our bedroom and this, this sort of the winter skyline, it's beautiful. And that's one of the attractions as well of coming to Birmingham. Yep. Uh, I lived in South East London for the last well, 12 years. Um, which is, which is great, London's a fantastic city to yeah. live in, but it feels like Birmingham is a lot closer connected to, to the countryside and has all the advantages of the big city as well. Um, but yeah, just a bit more gentle, I think, than London. So. Yeah. yeah, I think I'd agree, agree with that. Um, and what, what sort of advice would you give if someone um, was sort of young and aspiring to be in the sort of position that you are now? Um, any, any tips for new researchers? Yeah. I think. I guess two things that you need to balance out probably is one is staying focused on your research. You know, there are a lot of other things uh, that can happen and you can get involved in. But uh, sort of maintaining a, a, a clear sort of research focus is really key um, and obviously sort of publishing regularly based on that. But the other thing I would really uh, recommend, which is probably the best thing I, I've done and um, I'm really grateful is, is collaborations. So working with people from all over the UK and um, all over the world and really getting involved in your research community. I think that's, you know, when, when things get hard or you know, when you're struggling a bit, I think that's the thing that sort of gets you through yeah. um, and also gives you a much wider perspective on, on your research mm -hmm. and what you're doing. Oh, it's really good hearing about your research, Tom. Uh, nice Thanks. to catch you up. It's great to, yeah, it's great to talk to someone who's kind of really interested and, and to be, explain what I do. Yeah. Thanks very much. And not at all jealous of you going to I know. <laughs> It's tough. <laughs>